Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. Today is a special celebration. We're celebrating the ascension of our brother Jesus. His mission is over on earth, and he went back to the Father. Today is a very special day in Good Shepherd. For the first time, I'm going to share a homily with my brother Dave. So it's going to be the two of us with one homily. All right, so we're talking about the ascension. Now, interestingly enough, it's an important day for us, all right, but it didn't seem to be very important for two of the gospel writers. Now, Mark, who wrote the first gospel, talked about the ascension. Matthew, who copied Mark almost verbatim most of the time, didn't talk about the ascension. The ascension for Luke was very important because not only did Luke mention it in his gospel, but he also mentioned it in his Acts of the Apostles. John, on the other hand, never mentioned it. But interestingly enough, John gave a farewell discourse. All right, and during that discourse, which is in chapter 14 of his gospel, all right, which he gave before his death and resurrection. He was trying to prepare his disciples, all right, for the time when he would no longer be with them. And in that, we remember many important things, things that he said, things that had us mystified. For instance, he says to his disciples, you see me now, but you won't see me later left them scratching their heads. And then he said, you know, I'm going to prepare a place for you. My father has a house of many mansions, is the old translation. And I'm going to prepare a mansion for each one of you. And then he also said that when I leave, I'm going to present to you the paraclete who will be with you. Now, he said all of those things in this discourse in chapter 14. But there's one little phrase in verse 16 that I want each of us to remember. And that phrase is, I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you orphans. Now, through the power of YouTube, my voice is spread throughout. And there are many who are listening to me at this moment who were actual orphans. All right, through no fault of their own, either through the tragic death of their parents or whether or not their parents could felt they could take care of them, they were put up for adoption. They are true orphans. They know what it feels like to be an orphan. But yet there are many of us, although we are not true orphans, have felt orphans. We have felt alone. And that feeling can take place in a concert hall, can take place anywhere. You could be in the biggest crowd and you feel alone. What I would like to talk about this morning is that feeling of being an orphan and the promise that I will never leave you orphans. All right, so I have uh, two nuggets for you this morning. All right, and what's Finney homily without stories? So I'm going to give you two stories. One is what the Jewish literary writers called Midrash, all right? And Midrash is, once again, it's an element of truth surrounded by a totally fictional story. The second story I'm going to give you this morning is going to be factual. All right, so let me begin with the Midrash story. 
So we have this small town in the Adirondacks. They had a local drunk. His name was Tommy. All right. Tommy closed the local bar every morning. Never left the bar without last call. You know, on this particular day, it's early in the morning when the last call took place, one of the last ones to leave the bar, he's feeling pretty happy, pretty joyous. And as he leaves the bar, he sees this stanchion. You know, it's a sawhorse type of thing that guards, you know, like a traffic and construction area. He doesn't see it as a stanchion, all right? He sees it as a hurdle. Now, Tommy was the, the local track star of his high school when he was growing up. And he sees this hurdle in front of him. And he goes back to his glory days and he says, I'm going to jump that hurdle. And he tries to gather up steam. And of course he can't. All right, so he tumbles over the stanchion into a 10-foot ditch. Now, because he's very inebriated, he doesn't break any bones because alcoholics are usually pretty loose. So he picks himself up, has a few scrapes and bruises, and realizes that he's in this ditch. So he says, hey, yeah, I can get out of this ditch. So he goes to one side, starts climbing, and as we all know, mm -hmm. all right, loose sand, five or six feet, and you slip down again. So he does this for hours, going to each section of this ditch. Finally, the sun is rising, and he realizes that he can't get out of this ditch by himself. So people are starting to go to work. So the famous lawyer in town passing by, and Tommy yells up, Mr. Black, <coughs> Mr. Black, please help me. The lawyer looks down, sees Tommy in the ditch, reaches into his pocket, pulls out his card, throws it down to Tommy and says, listen, when you get out of that ditch, come to see me. We're going to sue who put that ditch here. Walks on, and Tommy is left there with this card. The next person that passes is the famous doctor in town. Dr. Rose, Dr. Rose, please help me. Dr. Rose looks down, sees Tommy there, reaches into his pocket, has a little tin of aspirins, throws it down to Tommy, and says, take tea, two of these, and when you get out, come to my office and we'll do x-rays. So finally, the priest comes by, and Tommy yells, Father White, Father White, please help me. Father White looks at him and says, Tommy, Tommy, I have to open the church for bingo. I don't have time right now. But when you get out of there, come and I'll hear your confession. So Tommy's left in the ditch. And finally, the stranger passes. And he yells up, Mister, mister, can you help me? The stranger looks down, immediately hops over the barrier into the ditch. And Tommy's saying, what the hell are you doing down here? You can't help me down here. I need you up there to help me. And the stranger puts his hands on Tommy's shoulder and he says, listen, he says, I'm in AA. He says, I've been in this ditch before. I know the way out. Follow me. And Tommy followed him and lived happily ever after. Tommy felt like being an orphan. All right? Yelled out and nobody was there. And yet, on his way following the AA guy, he might have heard, I will never leave you an orphan. I will never leave you an orphan. Now, the second story that I'm going to tell you is a true story. 
It's a story about Bill Wilson. You probably never heard of Bill Wilson. All right, Bill, Bill Wilson in the 1930s was a very famous, popular, brilliant stockbroker. Every stock exchange on Wall Street wanted Bill Wilson. He was brilliant when he wasn't drunk. Unfortunately, Bill was drunk most of the time. And his wife, Lois, would put him into hospitals to dry out. And he was in many, many hospitals. On this one occasion, he describes it as a spiritual awakening. He was laying in his bed and all of a sudden the room became bright. And he had the feeling that he was no longer an orphan. He had the feeling that somebody had his back. And Bill came out of that hospital and went to Oxford Group. Now Oxford Group was a Protestant denomination whose main ministry was to alcoholics. They weren't alcoholics themselves. Long story short, short, because this is a long story. All right, so Bill is staying sober through going to Oxford group meetings. He has a business trip to Akron, Ohio, and he's staying at the Mayflower Hotel. And every time he goes into the Mayflower to get to his room, he has to pass this bar. And that bar is calling his name. Every time that he passes it, the bar is saying, come Bill, I got something for you. And Bill is fighting mightily, and yet he knows that he probably is going to go into that bar before long. So through a series of phone calls, he hooks up with a local doctor, Dr. Bob Smith. And Bob Smith is like Bill Wilson. He's a good doctor when he's sober. Bill, uh, Dr. Bob could not stay sober long. So Bill Wilson makes an appointment with Dr. Bob. It was just supposed to be a short visit. And what happened is that they talked to each other about their need to drink. They talked for hours and they talked the next day for hours. And what they found out is that as long as they were talking to each other about their common problem, their need to drink went away. And all of a sudden, we have the miracle of AA. And that's how AA started. And I'm gonna hold up two books for you. This book you'll all recognize. This is the Holy Bible. All right, we all recognize this because we believe that this is God's inspired word. We believe that. I'm going to hold up another book for you. All right, this book is a very aged edition of a book called Alcoholics Anonymous. In AA, we call this the big book, all right? We who are in AA believe that this book was inspired. Because as brilliant as Bill Wilson was, he could not have come up with the ideas in this book. He presents in this book a way of recovery, not just from alcoholism, all right, but a recovery of your very being. There is a belief in AA that AA can get you sober, but unless you work the 12 steps in these, this book, you will remain the same person. And the same person will drink and drug again. So it's all about change. Unless you make the change, 
you will drink the drug again. And the change comes from working the 12 steps. The 12 steps are very laid out. You won't find a mason saying, I'm going to build a chimney on this building, and he doesn't start from the very top. He starts from the very bottom, layer by layer. The same thing with the steps, 12 steps. You can't jump to step six. You can't jump to step eight. You have to start at step one. And what I'm going to do just briefly now is explain the first three steps, all right, because that is the, the God steps, all right? And then Dave is going to take over, go through the other nine and the changes that take place through those nine. The first step, all right, is admitting that I am powerless over alcohol and that my life has become unmanageable. Unless you admit that, if you try your hardest, you cannot stop drinking. And Lord knows I've tried. You cannot do it alone. And the first thing that you have to do is finally raise the white flag and say, I can't do this. I am powerless over alcohol. Now, for many of you sitting and listening to me right now, that is a hard concept. All right? Now, I can say that to those people that are cancer survivors, to those friends of mine, Terry, Donna, who have gone through chemotherapy, and they tell us the rigors of chemotherapy, I can empathize, but I don't know. I've never been through it. And me telling you that an inanimate substance, a glass of liquid, has complete control over my life, many of you can empathize, but you just don't know. Powerless, I cannot by myself stop. And as a result of that powerlessness, my life is unmanageable. I can't manage anything, all right? I cannot manage my family. Bernie, who's sitting here, if it wasn't for her telling me that I can't take your drinking anymore, all right? At that point, my life was unmanageable. I wasn't managing it anymore, not to her satisfaction, not to the kid's satisfaction. Second step, after you do the first, after you admit you're powerless, and your life is unmanageable, came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I can't do it but I do believe that somebody can do it, all right? That somebody is a higher power than me because I don't have the power to do it. Third step, made a decision to hand my will and my life over to the God of my understanding. Now, what is interesting about this concept all right, something that, you know, the Oxford group and also the Washingtonians were another group that tried to help alcoholics. But they were Christian organizations. All right, and because they were Christian organizations, they fell by the wayside. The wisdom that Bill W. had was that it was the God of your understanding whether that's my Trinity, whether that's my Jesus Christ, whether it's my brothers down the block who pray to Yahweh, or my mosque up here who prays to Allah, or in the East that they pray to Buddha, it's the God of their understanding can restore them to sanity. 
Bill Wilson could not have formulated that without divine inspiration. I will not leave you an orphan. Every alcoholic and every drug addict and many parents of alcoholics and drug addicts, many family members, many friends feel orphaned because they can't help. I will not leave you an orphan. Now I want to ask Dave, my brother Dave, <coughs> to uh, finish this homily for me. Many thank you. Take a deep breath here. You know, a lot of what Vinny said and what Vinny's talking about is the spiritual sickness that people like myself and Vinny suffer from. Um, a few years ago, before the whole COVID thing happened, we talked about creating some type of support group within the church. And that support group uh, was really just a vision and an idea at the time. And uh, with the pastoral care ministry, we were able to put together the group that we call uh, Hand of Hope. And one of the reasons why I stand up here today, which is really an honor and a privilege to, to even be asked to do this, is so that we can roll out this meeting that we're going to have tomorrow night. And I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, never did I think that uh, if you knew people that know me now here today, if you knew the person that I was many years ago, uh, you know, almost five years ago, I'd, I'd be the last person that they would ask to come up here and, and share my experience. Um, I was not a good husband, not a good father. And, uh, you know, it's painful, but through the program of action that Vinny's talking about, right, the divine book that I believe I know is divine, the big book, you know, I'm in a different place in my life, you know, and the three things that Vinny talked about just now, basically we sum up real quick, right, step one is I can't, step two, he can, step three, so I'll let him, right, and then we get into, you know, what does that mean, and what, what it is, is there's a course of action in there. And that course of action can be taken by anybody. It's not just a drug addict or alcoholic, right? We're all powerless. We're powerless over our ego, our fear, whatever it may be. And, that, and I'm hoping that that speaks to this whole parish, okay? It's not just about alcohol and drugs, all right? Because if it was just about alcohol and drugs, I could put alcohol and drugs down, I wouldn't be, I would be fine. And that's not the case, okay? I have a, a hole in the soul, a spiritual sickness that exists after I put the drink down. And... Uh, and after we do that third step, the most important part is followed by the fourth step. And the fourth step is taking a personal inventory of ourselves. And what do we do, right? We, our whole lives, most of us believe that everything has been done to us, okay? And we have a bunch of resentments, fears, harms, all these things that have happened. And what we do is we write them all down. Very simple. We make a list. We write about basically who's done what to us um, and, and, and what that entailed. And then what our goal here is to get to where we see what did this affect? What instinct inside of us did this affect, right? Was, it, was this based off of fear, self-centeredness? What we find out in the fifth step when we sit down with somebody else and we admit these things is we identify the fact that most of the things, most of these prejudices and ideas that we have are driven by forms of fear and forms of self-centeredness. And it's a beautiful process when you go through and you do a fourth and a fifth step the problem is once you know all this and you start to realize that maybe that the way I see things, uh, the glasses that I look through are fogged, well, what do you do with that? Right? It's a great awareness to have, but uh, you know, it's just awareness at that point. So we take ourselves to the sixth step where we start to look at these things, right? All these fears that run my life. And we start looking at our character defects. And this is where the rubber meets the road, right? We ask God in seven to take away our shortcomings, to take away the things that are causing us to, to end up in these jackpots that we end up in over and over and over again. And, you know, it's great that we did all this and it's great that we identified these issues, but now we gotta go back and we gotta fix what we did. And that's what we do in eight and nine. We make a list of all the people we have harmed and we go out and we make these amends. And it's a, you know, it's a, a beautiful process, but a, you know, I'm not gonna lie, it's a difficult one. All right? think about, you know, whether you're an alcoholic or drug addict or not, I'm sure people that you know, are watching this mass have created some type of harm in their life. And to go back to somebody and say, hey, look, here's what I think I did. Tell me if there's anything else. 
And what do I do to make it right? You know, it's it's financial restitution. It's uh, a lot of emotional restitution. It's, it's not an easy process, okay? But once you do it, um, you know, and I'll share this. I, I want to make this brief, but it's... I got my chance here at the podium, so you know, I'm not going to make it too brief. But we get to a, a place where when we talk about this book being divine, okay, you know, the, Bill Wilson, I don't care how well of a writer he is, he, write, he writes it pretty well. I mean, it's a different language. He writes in the 30s, and sometimes it's difficult to understand them. But when you read about the promises that you get in the ninth step, I don't care whether you're alcoholic or drug addict or not, just listen to these promises, right? If we are painstaking about this phase in our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. And what, what are they saying there? Halfway through, once we're willing to start making these amends and go out and clean off the side of the street, it's amazing what starts to happen, okay? We will know a new freedom and a new happiness, right? The kingdom of God. What does Drew always talk about? Living in the kingdom of God here, today, now, sunlight of the spirit, okay? We will not regret the past nor wish to shut, up, shut the door on, right? If I regretted the past, I wouldn't stand up here. All right, so some of these promises have come true in my life. Um, we will comprehend the word serenity and know a new peace. Sounds like the kingdom of God to me. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see that how our experience could benefit others. And I'm gonna get there. That's what this is all about. For This is where the alcohol and the drug addict, that's what it's all about. It's all about what we can do for others, okay? Um, a feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. Uh, we lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip, will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. So, it's, uh, you know, it's hard for me to not get emotional because... To, to even think of how I ended up with Good Shepherd is, is, uh, is an unbelievable story, you know. Uh, my ex-wife was working at Social 37 and Father Vinny and, and Mother Donna, Sister Donna at the time were, were doing uh, ashes in a parking lot and they went to go eat in their robes. And, uh, and I was as broken as you can be. This is about five years ago, four and a half years ago in that range. And... Uh, and Donna gave her a card. My ex-wife said, listen, I don't know who they are, but they were dressed like monks. And, uh, but they, they, you know, the Holy Spirit was just beaming through, beaming through them, right? And, uh, and she gave me this card. And I remember, I remember calling Donna. I mean, I could have taken that card and threw it away. You know, and uh, my life has changed just so much. Because of making that phone call and having Donna and Joe and, and Drew and Vinny and all these people in my life. And you see my family here and, and what this is all about. And um, and it's just, it's meant a lot to me. And, and it's amazing what's happened. And I'm living proof that if you take the program of action that's in that book, and that's what, the, that's what we want to get to, right? We want to get to the hand of hope. I don't need to stand up here and cry all day. So... Our vision of this idea of trying to open this up to the parish. There's been people, a lot of people know my story, some do, some don't. Vinny and I will share our full story at some point uh, during these meetings. Right now, we've had so many parishioners come out and say that they want to share their experience, strength, and hope to the parish so that, you know, people know that there's people sitting in these rooms that have these experiences, whether they have a, ch a child, a friend, they grew up in a household, whether it was an alcoholic or a drug addict, mental health issues, whatever it may be, where there's some type of spiritual sickness. Church is great. We come here. It's fantastic. However, we, there's a lot of people that need that outside, that outside help. And that's what this meeting's about. Hand of Hope is designed so that we can have these meetings. People share their, their experiences in these areas. Some are going to be alcoholics. Some are going to be drug addicts. Some are going to be children of alcoholics. Whatever it may be. From that, if there's outside help that we can get you to, whether it be other fellowships, a lot of us are members of fellowships, we were willing to do that, right? That's the hand that we want to take you to hope and, and try to help people get better. Um, currently, the way this, we're going to roll this out is going to be tomorrow night's our first meeting at 7.30. It's going to be a hybrid meeting, which we're really excited about. Bear with us if there's any technical issues. 
Uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to be the technician on this, so bear with us, but we should, it should run really, really smooth. Um, uh, Catherine Scotto, uh, who was giving me permission to, to announce, she will be sharing her experience, strength, and hope tomorrow. Um, and, and all are welcome, right? We, we want you to know, we want the parish to log in and, and find out or come, okay? We're going to be downstairs in the basement at 7.30. Uh, we're really looking, the, the more participation we get, right now we're going to roll this meeting out. It's going to be once a month. It's going to be the third Monday of every month, of every month through, uh, I think we scheduled out right now to August. Uh, our hope is that this can become a weekly meeting, bi-weekly meeting, whatever it is, whatever type of participation or people see that they want it, we'll provide it, okay? And we can do some really cool things, right? We can go into the book. We can do some history. We can, we can show people um, that there's another way of life, okay? And they don't need to live in the bondage of, of you know, addiction and alcoholism and, and what's around that, okay? Uh, you know, I, I have an experience where I have a stepdaughter, you know, I can share this. She's a heroin addict. Well, was a heroin addict. She's how I end up here at Good Shepherd in recovery. Um, you know, I had a grandmother that drank herself to death. So I have experiences on, on all levels, and I am a drug addict and alcoholic. So uh, we're hoping to bring as many of those people with those experiences so that we can try to help people at Good Shepherd. We know that it exists. It's, a, it's a, uh, an unbelievable issue right now in our uh in society, and, and and it exists under these roof, this roof, and we know that. So uh, that's what we're hoping. If anybody wants to participate in this and feels that they want to, you know, whether it be break their anonymity, that's that's great. You don't have to do that. See me or Vinny. Um, I think that's really it. I want to just again thank you, Shepard. Uh, you know, it's been an unbelievable ride. I never thought that I would ever ever get asked to come up here. Believe me, I promise you. If if you saw the person that I was years ago, I would not have been invited to do this. Um, so I'm living proof that it works. Thank you. So a final word. <clears throat> if there is anybody who is listening to us this morning, all right, who can identify with being that orphan, having that orphan feeling, all right? If any of you, if our words reached you, all right, come tomorrow night. But at the very least, all right, this is our phone, all right? Those of you who are at home, if you want to, if you feel that we've reached you, if you want to talk to somebody, if you want to talk to me, the number is 609-207-9812. I'd be more than happy to talk to you. You are not an orphan. He is not orphaned you.